motorsports with its high-powered fossil-fueled engines is not what you'd call the perfect match with sustainability. But at the same time, motorsports has long been an innovator that has improved our cars and in turn our society, and so it's not sitting still. Motorsports is now taking the lead. Motorsports is now taking the lead when it comes to sustainability. You have the net zero program in Formula One. You have uh, racing teams like IndyCar that are getting official certifications in sustainability. New racing series like Formula E, Extreme E, focus on sustainability. And with us on the podcast today, we have a person that personifies the changing face of motorsports when it comes to sustainability, and that's Lucas Degrassi. He's a Formula E champion. He's driven in Formula One. But at the same time, he's also a United Nations Environmental Program Ambassador. He's started initiatives like Zero Summit, does talks all over the world on sustainability. Lucas, welcome to the Future Car Podcast. Hi, Ed. Thank you very much for having me here. It's a, it's a huge honor. And uh, yeah, it would be great to talk about a little bit about sustainability and motorsport. Well, let's start off on the motorsport side, and then we're definitely going to be jumping into sustainability. So you started racing karts at 9, 10 years old. Uh, you were a champion. And now you're, you're, you're called the, one of the most successful Brazilian drivers in a decade, one of the biggest names in history when it comes to Formula E. Tell us a little bit, what's the driving force behind Lucas de Grassi? What is it? <laughs> um, well, thank you very much, Ed. Uh, I, I, I'm just a, a, a guy that loves sports. Um, I started competing in racing when I was very young uh, as a hobby. Um, because my, my father used to do that as a hobby. And then one of the greatest sportsmen of all time and arguably the, one of the best of Brazil or definitely one of the best of Brazil was Ayrton Senna. Um, three times world champion in Formula One. And he was like a, a legend in Brazil and he died in a very tragic way. Um, in Imola, uh, 94 in the middle of the race. And I was watching that race. I was nine years old and kind of Brazil stopped for like three days. And because of that, uh, me as a child, that had a very important impact on how I saw the sport that I like or my hobby as a form of impacting people and how, how important that guy was for a country. Um, for the world, actually, uh, doing something he liked. And I was like, oh, if I can do maybe 1% of what he did, um, it would be very interesting. So I started actually becoming much more disciplined and much more focused on, on, on actually improving and trying to make motorsport uh, a way of my life. And it's extremely difficult in any sport to become a professional and actually to make money out of it or to make a living out of, of, of the sport that you like. And uh, I've been very fortunate to, uh, to be on my professional career now for 20 years, um, uh, from ranging from pretty much every single, single uh, type of racing that there is. And, um, using, and, and, and then clearly after, when I started to, to grow up, I understood that racing is also a business. Is also a platform uh, to promote brands, uh, manufacturers, uh, technologies, um, and that kind of mentality led through a series of decisions in my career, but one of them being to join Formula E uh, with Alejandro Agag and at a very, very early stage, and then to focus on this switching to electric uh, mobility into motorsport uh, within my, 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 let's say, my lifetime as a professional sportsman. So it was very interesting to see this transition. And in the middle of it, in the middle of, of it uh, also AI with driverless cars and so many stuff going on and the discussions and the policies and energy uh, 
uh, different countries producing the energies in a different way. They promote in different policies. So which technology goes where? So it becomes a very interesting problem to solve. And one of the things I like is about like solving problems. So that became part of the racing, part of motorsport. So kind of everything fall into all the pieces of the puzzle fall into, came together. into place as my career progressed. Yeah. I want to ask you one pure motorsports question. Then we, I want to, we can jump into Formula E and, and start the discussion uh, more along the sustainability side. But what would you say were the top three memorable moments from your career? Now, sometimes your first championship as a kart in karting might mean more than driving an F1 car, becoming a Formula E champion. If you had to rate them one, two, and three real quick from your entire career at the moment, and you had to compare how you felt at the moment, what would be your top three, you think? Memorable moments. So, uh, yeah. So when I was uh, 14 in, in go-kart, I won the All-America Championship. The Pan-American Championship was my first big victory, was FIA American Championship. Uh, which led me to be like welcomed in Europe to then challenge for the World Cup and stuff like this. So it was my first important championship. So definitely remember very well winning that, that, that championship. And then, um, when I won the Macau Formula three race, which is like the World Cup, uh, of uh, the world championship of Formula three, which is the formula before two and one. So it's kind of in your junior series almost like college football and you win the most important game ever and you score you're the mvp of that uh, of that match so that also kind of was another big jump in my career when i won macau in 2005 second place was robert kubica third was vettel uh back back uh, in that race and then i think my my championship winning uh year in formula e so when i won the championship 2017 uh, also, it was very, very important. Well, let's talk about the transition into Formula E. So you're, you're driving internal combustion engine cars up to that point, And now in the early, your first season, what, what was the transition like going from an internal combustion engine powered car from a race driver's standpoint to driving uh, an electric powered car? What was the thing that struck you the most as being uh, different? Yeah, it is not as different as people uh, think. Um, I was a, when I was in Formula One. I, I joined Formula One in 2010 as a race driver, and there were cars. The cars were already hybrid uh, back then, so there was uh, hybrid cars. Uh, so the electric technology was already kind of showing up here and there. It was a very niche part of the hybrid hybridization of cars. Uh, then I moved to endurance racing in 2013. Uh, which also there were four-wheel drive hybrid cars, uh, the, the very famous Audi, Le Mans winning cars, prototype uh, with more than a thousand horsepower. So I drove with hybrids and the hybrids were becoming better and stronger. So the electric part was getting um, more important than the combustion part. And so it, it was not like a transition, fully combustion, then okay, start fully electric. It, it, we've seen already this hybrid middle steps in many different categories going along and then in formula e the first time i drove the car was 2013 and what impressed me a lot was the amount of torque required uh, no gears and uh how quickly it accelerated how responsive it was to the pedal another interesting thing was that in low slow speed corners you could hear the car around uh, because you didn't have any engine to, to block the noises from the tire or the suspension. So you could hear the much more what was going on around you. The fact they have a battery, and we all know about our batteries in our phones. You say, hey, you know, don't let it go below 20. Don't charge it to 100%. Managing the batteries and all that is a key part of it. Just, when you're thinking about managing the life of the battery or getting the most out of your batteries, is it change your driving style in any way? Because that would be different from an internal combustion engine. Yeah, of course it changes. So, um, so you have your your in, in your driving style. There is a couple of techniques you do to do 
the lap as fast as possible. Like, I don't know, you brake as late as possible without braking too late. You accelerate as early as possible to, to, um, but not early, not too early, not too late. You accelerate. So you have to brake at the right point, accelerate at the right point, use the tire, use the downforce, uh, use the brakes, and you have to check the temperature of the tires. If they're That's okay all or the not. same. So there that is doesn't change. All this complexity. Yes, that, that's all the same. So th this is the, all this complexity remains the same. But then in racing with an electric car with battery, you add an extra variable, which you have to do all of this, but in the most efficient way. So you need to, um, it's kind of, it's kind of you plot this complexity into maybe a, a, a parable of shape and you need to drive in the most, in the best way you can, but also in the optimal energy uh, tip of this, of this driving. If you drive it, if you, if you, if you, for example, waste energy, but you go, let's say you waste 10% of energy, but you go only 1% faster, that will be fine in, let's say a combustion car, or even it's fine for us in qualifying, but not in the race. Because in the race, you would spend much more energy to go just a little bit faster. So kind of you need to find the right fine tuning, the right optimization of all everything that you do, put into this, put, putting an extra element of complexity into the account. So it becomes very, very difficult to manage the energy while going fast at the same time. But I think that the, the important thing here is, is that so you have this trade-off of performance versus efficiency. Like you say, you have this algorithm that's in the back that takes into account the changing nature of the, of the car, the changing nature of the track, the conditions, the temperature, who knows what, probably even the temperature of the batteries and, and, and all that. And ultimately, it comes down to these little green bars that you have to pay attention to. And then you adjust your style lap to lap. So that's really the, so ultimately you got to be a race car driver like you've always been. And by the way, you better be paying attention to these little green bars because that's how you're going to yeah, win. Yeah, well, that was, yeah, we, we have not only the bars, we have some haptic and sound feedback ah. to kind of tell you what, what you need to do uh, also. But in the end, you're trying to simplify it because at the same time, there is three guys trying to pass you. You are a few centimeters from the wall. So, I mean, there is a next corner is coming up. So you don't, you cannot just look at those bars and think, oh my yeah. God, <laughs> three or four or five. Uh, there is no time to do all of that. So it's, it, it's kind of, it has to be kind of instinctive. And that's why we use the simulator so much because this type of, it, it needs to be natural. So you need to practice that. So that's why it's very difficult for a driver to jump in the seat in Formula E and be a good driver straight away. It requires probably months of training to understand all of that and then trying to kind of feedback to your driving style in the race. In qualifying, it doesn't really matter. In qualifying, it's basically go as fast it. as you can go. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. It doesn't matter how much energy you use. You just go flat out. So very different strategies, very different driving styles from um, uh, qualifying to race, including how you set up the car, how you change the car from, uh, let's say, qualifying to the race to suit this um, – optimization from one to another. How would you describe, say, let's go ahead 10 years from now. Um, and let's just, let's not worry if it's Formula E or Formula One or whatever, but it'll probably be a more sustainable form of racing with some sort of electric or hydrogen power, who knows what, but 10 years ahead. The question is, how do you think the event will be different than say a Formula One or a Formula E event right now? The way uh, a spectator, be they online or be they present, how do you think they're going to have a different experience then compared to what they're experiencing now? Uh, if I knew, uh, I'll be a multi-billionaire. <laughs> uh, Take a guess. Take, what do, what uh, do you think? How will it be different? Uh, so so your question is probably the most difficult one because in Globes, my understanding or my prediction of how human behavior is going to change in 10 years. And for me, this is the most fascinating unknown, uh, let's say, understanding of, 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 uh, of society. 
h- how human behavior and human preferences will change in a such a fast pacing, such uh, fast developing technology, uh, technology being developed so fast world will be in 10 years. So I, I, I definitely don't know this answer. I am, let's say, or it's easier, or for me it's easier to focus on how the technology is going to look like and what could be accepted in the way, so where the technology will be or needs to be and what would be so... Uh, what will be morally, ethically, and society will accept it to be uh, to be there. And I don't know if it's 10 years, 15, or 20, but at one point, having combustion cars um, uh, that pollutes the environment, uh, racing each other, uh, will be almost, for me, it will be almost as impossible to see as a tobacco advertising uh, nowadays because uh, 10 years ago or let's say 15 years ago in many countries in the world you could smoke inside you could uh, maybe 30 years ago you could smoke in airplanes i remember that's how old i am uh, i remember being uh, in a flying when i was very young from brazil to europe and there was a smoking section and there was a non-smoking section and today it's completely unfathomable to to think about um, uh, such uh, such things, so combustion engine cars, even combustion cars in dense packed cities, it will be impossible to see. It will be impossible to kind of you, you, maybe even if it's possible to use them, it will be seen in a such bad way that uh, I think it will be impossible to have an event that promotes this type of technology. So. Definitely, this will change. But then, could, could you use uh, other forms of fuel? This, yes. I. My prediction is that battery electric vehicles will dominate um, the market uh, m- much more than any other technology for commercial cars, for, let's say, um, private use and small vehicles. The smaller the vehicle, the more battery electric it will be. Hydrogen will have maybe maybe some space in large trucks and some other forms of of transport. Uh, maybe sea shipping, maybe um, uh, aeroplanes, but it's hard to see as well. But anyway, going back to your question, the, how do I see the sport? Um, I see it. So the sustainability side already explained. And then the second part, uh, we will have computer systems that drives better than any other racing driver in the planet. The same as if you take a very advanced chess engine or you take, let's say, Alpha Zero or, or, uh, or, or, uh, or any of the, the, uh, stockfish, uh, engine chess engine it will beat any of the grandmasters today yeah. in a very easy way you have ai beating any racing driver on the planet at any conditions in a very easy way so i see also the sport segmenting a lot the technology that will go to conventional cars in terms of how ai and how computer systems and machine learning and everything controls the vehicle and what actually the sport of who is the best human that can control a car can be. At the moment, there is a little bit of a, uh, they, are a bit, they are a bit combined. So when you look at the Red Bull or a Mercedes or a top team in Formula E, there is a lot of computing and there is a lot of programming that helps the driver to achieve its success uh, more and more. So the sport will become more segmented also to, to promote the human side, because I think that's the only way it can survive. Well, you know, uh, and, and I do want to ask you uh, a little bit later about Robo Race, but I think your 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 point about the rules is a really really important one because if there were no rules and technology was master, next thing you know, the human you don't need them in the car anymore. However, it's that human element that probably helps make and probably is one of the key factors in making racing exciting. 
and draws the crowd in. And so let's just say that the rules will be set up in such a way that it, it still relies on the ability of the human to be masterful in whatever technology is presented to them, and they pay a key role in that. How do you think the spectator side is going to change? So, for instance, there's more and more where you can go online and you vote for the best driver and they get a power boost or uh, the ability maybe to use augmented reality or whatever it might be to almost sit in the car itself. How do you think that's going to play a role, say, in 10 or 15 years? In RoboRace, we had a, a project, which I, I started when I was there, which was uh, an augmented reality uh, software that actually you could buy and throw things on the racetrack that the car needed to avoid. So the so you could buy like uh, like a ball or a, or a, or a, I don't know or a, I don't know a piece of wood or whatever you or, or even like a truck, put it on the racetrack for a few seconds, and the cars actually needed to avoid that. At um, at the CES show in January in Las Vegas, uh, one of the things I did was I'm going to discover all the new electric vehicles of all types, and one of the things I found that was really interesting was it was it, it was a like a small motocross bike. That's how I would describe it when I first saw it. And I said, tell me about this. Is this a motorcycle? Is it an e-bike? Is it a moped? What is this thing? And he says, oh, it can be all of those. And you can also take the battery out and use it as a generator to charge your phone or run something. And I said, well, how do you convert it from a a moped to a you know, motorcycle, whatever. He says, oh, it's all in the software. We can, we can constrain it. I said, well, wait a minute. Uh, how, how do you do that? I mean, I buy it as a, as a moped, but couldn't I hack it and make it into a uh, motorcycle and let the horse, you know, the power go up? I said, aren't there laws about that? And he goes, well, there aren't any laws yet. He said, it's almost like the laws have to keep oh. up. Uh, because now the possibilities, and, and you see this also with some of the pickup trucks and things out there now, like the Silverado or the Ford Lightning. It's a generator for your home as well as a pickup truck. How do you see the regulations holding us up or not keeping up? How, how, what, what needs to be done there? Is enough being done? Yeah, one with the Micro Mobility uh, Federation that owns the electric scooter championship that we created actually one of the, the things that we want to kind of create a set of uh, rules for the sport worldwide, but this needs to do in society. The technology evolves much faster than government regulation. There is nothing slower than government probably uh, on, on, on earth. So yes, um, there are many examples with like uh, Germany. Now you need any kind of e-bike, you need a number plate. In some places, uh, e-scooters are forbidden. In other places, are not. Um, but this example that you pointed out, having a software-controlled hardware that you can change the hardware as you wish, is my dream for Formula E as well. So uh, at the moment, uh, Formula E just opening up like a branch in the tree of conversation here. So now Formula E is run as a combustion uh, championship electrified. So everything that happens in combustion, you just take the fuel tank, put battery, you take the combustion motor, you put an electric motor. I think this needs to be completely changed. And actually, you adapt the car and the safety rules with software. I give you an example. With Formula E, it's very easy to say, look, this track, the car now, Formula E car has... 800 horsepower available, but it's too much. With 800 horsepower average, the car will reach, I would say, maybe near 400 kPa. Will, will be something insane. So you could come to, let's say, Rome, which was the race we had last week, and say, okay, the homologation for this track is 387 horsepower. You set the rule, change the software, the power limit is 387. Then you go to the next track. Oh, the homologation for this track that, I don't know, is underneath the Eiffel Tower uh, that goes close to the river and back. For this track, it's 237. 
Okay, we race at 200. Okay, now we go to a grade one track, uh, Mexico City, that we Formula One races, the same place, or Monaco. Okay, now you can unleash all horsepower. And you can do that even corner by corner. So, for example, if you need to do a very long straight, you could do, okay, in the exit of this straight, from this line on the ground onwards, because the car can read a magnetic stripe on the ground very easy, from this line onwards, you have 172 horsepower. From that line onwards, you have 800. You can have different ride heights. You can de- have a different, you can have movable aero devices. You can even have rear wheel steering, all controlled by software or not. You say for this event is fixed, for that event is not fixed. It's a basically a software controlled car. And that's not the case at the moment, but that's where I wanted to go. Well. So if you think about uh, optimization algorithms like you created uh, for your uh, your power, there, there may be, I don't know if it can be figured out, an optimal algorithm for the entertainment factor that you get for the human to have to deal with these different changes. And it could be dependent on, like you said, the, the ratio of the length of straightaways to, to turns and the sharpness of the turns, the maybe you're playing with the aero devices, limiting horsepower. It's almost like you've got all these dimensions that could make it more challenging for the human to deal with. And even the engineers and the race uh, uh, people that are behind it and doing all the planning and the strategy, it's like all these dimensions you could add to it that you can't do with an internal combustion engine series. It, It sounds like that's where you're headed with this. Yes, you, you actually, that's a, a great idea that I never thought of, but you gave me a, actually a great insight uh, during this uh, conversation right now, which is actually you could create a set, a set of algorithms that could read the public feedback to a determined change in regulation or part of the race and kind of opti- optimize the rules to have more of that, to have more of that almost like the social media feeds you what you want to see, but it kind of changes the rules or gives you, let's say, uh, advices on how to change the sporting and technical rules to actually maximize entertainment. This could be done. Again, with, with, with AI, pretty much everything could be done. It's just a matter of uh, having the right data, feeding the right data, so having the right sensors and having the right um, uh, algorithm to 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 uh, to calculate to process this data, but yes, that's actually a great a great point, and I th- I think for Formula E, this is a great opportunity to actually start doing that to have a software based uh, modular car, uh, stop following the traditional rules of combustion motorsport and kind of open this new door uh, into, yeah, how software can control pretty much everything. And this can only be done, or it's much easier to be done with a fully electric uh, car instead of a combustion one, because a combustion, again, the parameterization is hard, the way to control the the quality, even the, I know that from my previous years, even exact same engines, combustion engines, they have differences of one to 2%, it's very, very hard to have combustion engines very equal for a long period of time because often the friction of one slightly more than another, one decays more, one ring loses compression more than another. With an electric motor, actually, all the motors are exactly the same to the thousands of the horsepower. And then also the driver becomes more relevant because the equipment can be actually closer together. Uh, and you can control that with software again. I have to ask you about this, but uh, there was this back and forth you had with Vettel, where he said that the, uh, oh, what they're doing in Formula E is not applicable. Uh, how did that all get resolved? I know you're going back and forth on that. What, what was his point? I, I almost, I, I, I explained. I, I didn't was- understand too. So, so basically he said that Formula One is more sustainable than Formula E. And I was like, Okay, Formula E is going to say something about this because, right, I mean, we use one set of tires, they use 20. 
We have electric cars, zero emission. We are net zero from inception. Formula One, or clear, is not. It's trying to go somehow, but they 95% of the emissions are from flying anyway. So I didn't understand. So I was like, okay, this is 100% bullshit. Why? Well, you cannot just say something like this without concrete examples of why you think this is the case. Um, so I, I didn't, I, I mean, I didn't understand either. And there was no actually an argument that I can point and say, oh, this is right or this is wrong. It was just like a phrase out of nothing. Uh, but the surprising thing was that nobody said anything, including Formula E. And I was the only one saying, okay, th this makes no sense. Also, what Formula One is doing in many occasions, like these if you things that they are trying to promote, <clears throat> will never work in a commercial car. It can actually, it, would, it could make Formula One cars net zero carbon emission, uh, the cars while they are racing, but it's not applicable to commercial vehicles because you need electricity, you need to, to, it's very expensive. You need the surplus of energy. The energy needs to produce from renewable sources and so on and so forth. We can go into the detail uh, in a later stage. But the point is, it, it's it, nobody called the bullshit. And I was the only one to say, okay, what do you mean? And that created a little bit of uh, a chaos. But my question was a, was a genuine question. Say, what, what exactly do you mean by this? I can't wait, wait to have you back either by yourself or also with uh, Sebastian. But nonetheless, thank you so much and good luck in your next race. Thank you, Ed. Thank you very much for this uh, podcast and everybody that uh, took the time for uh, listening to us.